Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to What Makes a Toy a STEM STEAM Toy. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a very fruitful conversation. Also, know that this session is going to be recorded, and we'll, we're going to be publishing it in many, many different ways. And um, you can find out when you're on the website, and we can explain that later on. Anyway, STEM STEAM. You know, it's like in our lexicon now, it seems. If you walk the aisles of Toy Fair, you see it everywhere and all. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, when, at least for me anyway, when I go up and I ask people, well, what do you mean by that? Or why is this toy a steam toy or whatever? I get a myriad of different answers. So we at the Toy Fair last year decided, you know, maybe as a service to our membership, let's at least try to harness the STEM STEAM thing enough that there's be greater understanding of it and beyond that, if possible. And, um, so, and so we, have, we did a, an initiative in two phases. The first phase was really trying to identify what is STEM and STEAM. And that already now is a white paper that's on the geniusofplay.org. Is that correct, Anna? Genius of Play? Oh, it's on the Toy, so toy Association.org website. It's our white paper. The way we developed that was through a number of different experts um, in the field of, of, th this, uh, of STEM and STEAM. So that's happening right now. Now we're into phase two, and phase two is kind of where the rubber meets the road. We said, okay, fine. We have a better understanding maybe of what STEM and STEAM is, at least from the experts and, and at least from the landscape that what we're seeing, but what is that doing with toys? How is, how are, how is STEM STEAM being utilized for, in toys, et cetera? And where is it going to go? How far can it go? How much, what criteria can be used? Can criteria be used? I mean, these are all questions, obviously, and all. That's the reason why we're here this afternoon. And that's part of our phase two initiative. Um, I want to welcome Courtney Schley, who is the research editor of Wirecutter magazine. And we have a great panel, and Courtney's going to introduce them. So welcome. Hi, so I'll start off by apologizing for my uh, somewhat um, husky voice. Um, we know kids are kind of the center of everything that's happening here, and they're the center of my life, too. I have three little kids, and at least one of them gave me some virus before I came to New York, so, um, but I'm gonna try my best. Um, so I'm, I'm an editor at Wirecutter, which is a product reviews website owned by the New York Times Company. And um, I've, as a journalist, have focused on um, testing and recommending products for babies and kids, and especially educational toys is something I've been very, very interested in and have um, you know, researched, tested, recommended. Um, and, and especially reporting on these connections between play and learning has been a really important part of what I've, what I've been trying to write about. Um, so you know, the questions we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna introduce the panelists next, who are the ones who are gonna give us these, uh, you know, the, this really interesting discussion. These are, these are questions that are being talked about in a lot of different settings, actually. Um, you know, how play and learning work together, how toys can facilitate learning, and especially within specifically the STEM, STEAM kind of um, world is something that, you know, child developmentalists are working on these questions in research labs, and um, parents are asking these questions uh, when they're in the toy store, and they, they want information, and they want to know more, and they want to learn more. There's a lot to learn. So um, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists now, who are going to really get this discussion going. Um, we have <coughs> Tom Runtz, um, who's Director of Product Development at Learning Resources, which is an educational toy company. Um, Aya Badir, founder and CEO of Little Bits, um, the, the circuitry, modular circuitry toys. Um, we have Andres Garza, who is a senior design manager for Spin Master and formerly from NASA, right? Um, Netta Rabin, a vice president who leads a product development team at Klutz. And um, Jim Seymour, um, who is a vice president and CTO of eBlocks. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you to our panelists. Um, I'm going to be drinking a lot of tea as I ask the questions, but um, we'll just get started because we have a lot of questions. And the first one that I'm going to actually ask all, all five of our panelists to weigh in on, I'll start with Tom, which is um, when we talk about STEM STEAM toys, um, what, from, you know, from your perspective, what are sort of the top, let's say, three 
unifying characteristics that you would say a STEM STEAM toy um, should have? Yeah. Absolutely, and, and I just want to set off by saying no added pressure when you find out one of your fellow panelists is from NASA. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would say, in, in keeping it succinct, what we have found as a company is that uh, products that are open-ended by design uh, and play pattern, uh, that encourage trial and error, um, would be a secondary uh, component. And then, and this is where it gets into a little bit of a gray area, I think, one that does encourage an interdisciplinary approach of subject matters. Now, we found early on that doesn't necessarily have to involve equal parts, science, technology, engineering, and math. You can end up with products we call Frankenstems, putting things together. Uh, but one that definitely encourages an interdisciplinary approach of more than one subject matter in you know, the early learning. Um, so, um, I get asked this question a lot, and uh, I have a very long answer, but I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you the short version of it. Um, I believe any toy can be a STEM STEAM toy. Um, I don't believe that um, you get to put a label on something and kind of decide whether or not it is. Um, I think the fundamental um, thing that we have to evaluate is, uh, does it teach the method? So um, the, uh, the core method is the engineering method or the scientific method or the design thinking method. They're all essentially the same thing. It's about coming up with a hypothesis, um, making uh, a solution to the problem, watching uh, the results of your uh, solution, and then iterating until you get to a, a final end. So we, at uh, Little Bits, made something called the uh, Little Bits Invention Cycle, which is essentially a simplified version of the scientific method, and it's called uh, Create, Play, Remix, Share. So uh, it's about first hands-on building, um, uh, uh, playing with the thing that you made, observing it, seeing how it's working, remixing, iterating on it, improving it, uh, and then sharing, because sharing uh, your work is a key part of the component. And for us, that's kind of the fundamental of how you define something that is a STEM steam toy. I would agree with Aya in uh, the fact that I like to keep it very broad, uh, find a lot of things that can actually apply to it. Um, really, first and foremost, like that growth through challenge, those little steps, things that challenge kids and get them to get outside of their comfort zone. Um, and ultimately, second, a pride of accomplishment, being able to get to that point where they feel satisfied with it. And uh, lastly, uh, sparking curiosity, something that actually drives them to continue forward, to encourage them to do more of it. Um, I'd agree with my very smart panelists and um, don't want to repeat what they said because I agree with so much of it, open-ended play, creativity, um, teaching the fundamentals of STEAM. And I would just also add that, you know, it's a toy, so you have to take out the intimidation factor. A kid is more likely to stick with it if it's something they're really interested in doing in the first place, so it's got to look fun. It needs to speak to their talents, their motivation, whatever seems fun and interesting to them, and then they're going to keep on trying. And even if they fail at first, they're going to want to build or make that final thing. And so. You've got to introduce something they love. So the good thing about going last is I get to hear all the answers. And the bad thing is I got to come up with someone new, something new. But um, to add to uh, the answers here, um, first, I would say a really good STEM STEAM toy would be one that engages the child. Um, that may be something that's pretty broad and true for any toy. But particularly, you know, we know that when you're engaged and you're having fun, then you're learning. You, whenever you're playing, you're learning. Okay, So making it engaging, making it something that they want to do will start, you know, get in, them into the, the play and the learning aspect right from the start. Then I think a good toy would, a STEM STEAM toy would have some educational information available there for the kids that now that they're engaged and they're curious about how this works, there's some explanation about the science, technology, engineering, and math that goes along with that toy because that's, again, how you learn once they're engaged. And it may not be, maybe they won't get into the reading of that that you wrote there, but maybe the parents will. Maybe the parents will see the cool thing that the kid designed there and be curious about it and read and then explain that to the kid. And that's still learning. That's still a way to learn. And then the third aspect that's similar to um, what was mentioned here was the open-ended creativity. Um, you know, toys that are just all instructive, I would say are STEM, but maybe not STEAM. 
instead of saying, okay, do the X, Y, and Z, maybe in your toy you say, do X, Y, and how would you do Z? To make them think through it and apply the knowledge of the things that they learned in that toy, that's where the real arts come in and being able to apply you know, the learnings that you got from the toy. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so um, open-ended is, uh, that's kind of a characteristic that I think almost everybody touched on in their answers about what, what a, a STEM or STEAM toy um, should, should have. Um, Aya, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on um, if, if there's a toy that has a right answer, let's say a single right answer, like a puzzle or a certain challenge that does need to be solved in a specific way, um, does that toy therefore you know, not really meet the full capacity of a STEM toy, just kind of by its nature? Or is there a place for toys that aren't as open-ended still within this realm of STEM toys? Um, we found that you need a balance. Um, so when I first started Little Bits, uh, I was very ideological about it being completely open-ended. There'd be no instructions. You have to really um, encourage open-ended play. But we found that some kids wanted a little bit more structure in the beginning and wanted to um, see success in what they made. And so now we have a balanced approach where you have an early success uh, that we've designed in where we give the kid instructions uh, on how to achieve uh, a specific outcome. Um, it helps with their self-confidence. Uh, it helps with them getting to know the system. Um, and then right after, we uh, use this as a jumping off point to make it open-ended. Um, ultimately, to go back to my previous answer, it's about teaching the method. Uh, and the method is, you know, the engineering method, the design method, um, is really equipping them with the ability to react to change as it happens. So we call that playful failure. And so um, in, we try to inject it in the process. So you have an early success, you have an open-ended prompt, and throughout we're making the kid comfortable that failure is part of the process. And so as they're failing, they're using that as input to their next uh, iteration, and then that keeps them going. Um, I think um, I don't like to make judgments on on other uh, toys and products, but uh, I'm not. Um, uh, I don't. I don't find that it's uh, a puzzle is fulfilling the full um, the full potential of what you could do. That that said, you could have a puzzle and another toy, and together they could be complementary in fulfilling um, that purpose. Thanks, um, Andres. I'd love to hear also thoughts on this. So I work on uh, Erector Set. I've been working on Erector Set the last five years. And when I started uh, doing research on finding what kind of consumer, what consumer research showed that we had two very distinct type of kids. Some kids needed instructions. They really wanted it immediately. Other kids had difficulty looking at it. They almost immediately jumped to starting to build creatively. Um, again, that's consumer research. It's not really how kids operate. Kids can actually switch. But we've realized working directly with the community kids switch from one to the other. A very creative kid can sometimes find that once they sit down with the instructions, they start doing things that they couldn't normally do on their own. They start excelling, they start learning the formal way of doing it. Sometimes a kid who maybe is scared to get into the more creative side can get over those initial fears and start uh, exploring, getting a little bit more open-ended. Um, with a puzzle, it's kind of a, to me, doing things step by step, you go through it enough times, Eventually, I think it initiates a desire to want to create your own puzzle, create something on your own. So in that sense, I would still consider a puzzle something of esteem, having esteem benefit. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, um, you know, open-ended can be scary for a kid or for an adult. And so understanding that, um, you know, even with a, with a STEM toy, having something that's scaffolded and directed at the beginning can end up being more fruitful, maybe in some cases, than just purely open-ended. Um, so this, this next question is really interesting. Um, because it kind of uh, goes, goes deeper into the definition of what we're talking about. And I'd, I'd love to start with Netta on this one. Um, it's really relevant for, for Klutz. Um, so this STEAM is adding art into this science, technology, engineering, math equation. And a big question I know parents have is, what makes a toy a STEAM toy versus a STEM toy? And then is a STEAM toy with you know, the art um, aspect to it, is that different from an arts and crafts toy? Um, so, Netta. Yeah, um, you know, I don't see a big def differentiation between STEM and STEAM. I think that you do need the A in there. I think people just say STEM and STEAM because maybe STEAM, you know, isn't as well known. Um, but as we all sort of answered, having that creativity and that creative problem solving in there is really important. 
um, in these toys. Um, I think it takes away the intimidation factor from kids by using materials like arts and crafts materials like felt or clay along with things like circuits and electronics allows kids into that space um, and they feel really um, confident because they, they know these things and then they see that one success as Aya was saying and can take it further. Um, so, I mean, I think absolutely being able to creatively problem solve um, is what makes it steam and what makes people different from computers which can, which can just problem solve and, and don't have the creative piece to it. Um, Jim, can you talk on, on creativity and art? Yes. <clears throat> so I think um, to me, to add the A to STEM and make it STEAM, um, a good STEAM toy would encourage the kid to do the creative thinking. I mean, there can be products where, again, like I said, they just give you all the instructions and then that's it. And they may get creative still after they've done it. They may still want to play and get creative, but they might not. They might just say, I'm done. Okay. And so to have something there that actually engage, encourages them to think beyond just the instruction, like I said, instead of just X, Y, Z, you give X and Y, but then you ask the question, how would you do Z? And maybe you do have the answer online or something, but make them think, okay? Do something that, so they don't just stop playing with the toy, they actually start thinking about how they can apply it. Um, and then the other question here about, you know, how is it different from arts and crafts? Well, I think arts and crafts can still be the A in STEAM. I'm not saying that that it's not. But uh, oftentimes, you know, when we think of the arts, maybe most people are thinking something that, you know, that looks like artwork and is beautiful or looks really cool. But there's another arts that maybe we don't think about as much, which is really related to the, the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. And one example I'll give is, um, you know, we make electronic construction sets to teach electronics, and electronics is an art. I mean, there's approximately infinite number of applications of circuits in this world, okay? And there's no handbook that's going to tell you, when I need this circuit to do something, you know, I go to this handbook and it tells me what the circuit is. I mean, you learn about how resistors, capacitors, transistors work, and then it's an art to figure out how to design a circuit to do what it is you need it to do. And so I think of that as different from the arts and crafts, and that can also be an important aspect of the A in STEAM. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think what, what gets interesting there is, is how STEAM toys can potentially reach the kid who identifies as the artist. I think what Jim was saying about electronics, I mean, you know, is there a way to reach kids who they love art and to say, hey, art, you can make art with electronics. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's, there's so much potential there. Absolutely. Um, so um, this next part is kind of talking about, um, you know, there's a huge body of research um, among child developmentalists and pediatricians about, um, you know, how kids learn through play, because that's really playing and learning are the same thing for young kids. They learn when they play, they play when they learn. And the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, they came out with a report um, in 2018, talking about play and toys with some recommendations um, for pediatricians and parents, one of the things that that report touched on um, is that you know, research has shown that simple toys, hands-on toys, very concrete toys, manipulative toys, those are ones that research has shown are kind of the most nutritious in a lot of cases for kids to really be learning from, especially younger kids, as opposed to, let's say, toys that may be a little more complex, have digital aspects, that sort of thing. Um, and with that in mind, um, uh, Tom, I'd love to hear your, your take on this. Um, when you're, you know, when designing STEM steam toys, does the simplicity, the concrete aspect, the manipulative, hands-on aspect, does that come into the design process? Is that a critical part of making a, a STEM or steam toy for a, for a kid, especially, let's say, a younger kid? Um, yeah, good question. I, I think that the way I approach it is, is looking at it this way, not so much um, for learning resources. Should a good STEM steam toy have these, uh, a simplicity of design or hands-on approach, but rather can it? Because for our customer and a lot of what we discovered through our internal research is, uh, as an example, I, I see a picture has been put up there with a few talking point references here. When we looked into coding uh, as obviously a, a, 
you know, a new curriculum that parents are very involved in, we found that 70% um, of our customer base felt it was important to introduce coding as early as four or five years old, but when asked if they uh, felt that they had the necessary tools to do that, uh, less than 15% felt equipped. And so we felt that there was a place for us to step in and by design say, can we take a simple hands-on manipulative based approach to designing introduction to coding? And that's where we came up with uh, Botley. He's the top right picture there. And I apologize for the shameless plug, but he won Innovative Toy of the Year. And as a small company, we couldn't be more proud of him uh, for being recognized that way. Um, and, uh, and it was really a proof for us internally that we're doing the right things. And in this case, it's not so much that we're saying um, this is the definitive way to teach coding, but rather for parents who want to learn how to start teaching uh, coding. The fundamental building blocks of computational thinking can be found in what we introduce here in a hands-on environment. Things like sequential logic, problem solving. All of these things can be done in a, a simple hands-on way in which you map out a 3D environment for a child and uh, they follow very familiar play patterns for themselves. And before you know it, we like to call it stealth steam. Um, they're learning something and they're learning the building blocks of coding. And so uh, the way I would answer it is that it is not critical that all toys be simple. I think that our companies represent a wide swath of great toys from simple to technologically advanced and I think STEM can operate across all of them. Um, Jim, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I fully agree that, you know, the, the term critical makes it sound like it has to be there. And I would agree that, you know, there are great STEM and STEAM toys that are advanced and there are advanced kids and uh, out there that are going to, um, you know, really benefit from that. Um, but having some toys that provide the simple steps at the beginning is extremely valuable, okay? I think that, um, you know, whether it's in, in our case where we use, you know, brick construction sets, getting, you know, just the motor skills at the very young age, or even for, you know, the developmentally challenged, you know, those types of simple toys where you're plugging together bricks and maybe, you know, you can build real simple and make something light up and get a result, is is very valuable not only for the motor skills but also for the confidence i think that was mentioned earlier on the panel how you know you want to start simple and get you know the confidence there because if a kid starts playing with something and they can't do it and they get frustrated not only will they stop playing with a toy but they'll feel a sense of failure and that's not what you want you want to start with something where they can do it it provides a result, they really feel like they accomplished something, and then they can go on to do the advanced set, okay, at some point. So yes, I, I definitely totally agree. It's not critical, but sets that have it are, have extreme value too. Tom, um, just because I want to cause trouble on this panel, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think about um, labeling things STEM that are for like one-year-olds? Um, do you think that kids at one, zero to one, can really learn STEM at that early age? Um, yeah, you are stirring trouble. <laughs> 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 this is where I think, um, and I was going to mention, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, and I, I mentioned, I asked Courtney if uh, she had had discussions with STEM.org, and I do think it's important for there uh, to be organizations out there like that. And in this example, like we work closely with STEM.org, and, and currently we have more than 70 of our products STEM authenticated. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not saying there should be some police force out there, but I think that we, uh, as, as leaders in the toy industry, owe it to the parents out there um, to not be mislabeling toys. And, and, I, and I want to take it one step further. I feel that this discussion almost forces us, when, when the puzzle question was asked, I started thinking it's almost as if we're, we're, we're taking an approach that's like there might be something wrong with puzzles. I, and, I think, and I think we all agree we should embrace the toys that have been traditional we toys and not all of them have to be STEM. Right. So I, I think that that would be my answer. Yeah. That's a really interesting. So, Netta, your question actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump a little bit um, because we have a question on this because it is a really um, a really uh, I think kind of interesting point maybe to start talking about in the context of this panel and beyond is um, should there be you know should there be industry standards about what a STEM or STEAM toy if you're marketing your toy that way what that means. Um, from my perspective as a journalist, I'm writing for parents. I know parents want to know if a toy is saying it's educational. 
where does that come from? What, it, what does that mean? If a toy says that it, you know, it helps children learn certain STEM, still, STEM skills, STEAM skills, what does that mean? Um, so should there be some sort of you know, move to have standards around that? Um, if so, what, would, what might that look like? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so, I mean, there are many schools of thought. One school of thought says that it should be like the organic, you know, movement, that it should be like, is it organic? Is it free range? Is it, uh, you know, uh, and then that becomes a label. Um, maybe, maybe that would be good. Um, my point of view is that this is going to be a moving target. So we started with STEM. Um, and then um, uh, John Maida, the former president of Rhode Island School of Design, said it should be STEAM because we need art in there. Uh, and then a uh, new uh, sort of swath of people said we should include robotics, so it should be STREAM. Uh, and then uh, now there's talk of like, oh, what, what do we do when like AI becomes a thing? Is it like stream A? <laughs> <laughs> you, th this thing is going to be, it's going to be an elusive target. We're gonna have to uh, kind of adapt. Um, I go back to the idea that uh, it's about the method that you're teaching. It's about the method of uh, being able to start something, iterate on it, and learn what you need to learn uh, during the process and, and look at your improvement. I think that the industry is potentially less the problem. I, uh, at the risk of also causing trouble, I think parents are the problem. <laughs> I think parents are over anxious and parents are transferring their anxiety on their kids. And, um, parents uh, hover over the kid, playing the playing with the toy, want to uh, get them to the right solution. They take over uh, experimentation. They take over the making process, and then the kid is watching. And it's no no different than the way we learned engineering when I was uh, in undergrad, which is a lab assistant is making something, and you're looking over their head, and that's useless. So I think that you know maybe there should be a label. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, we personally, uh, at Little Bits, we focus more on um, reviews and awards, um, and we've gotten many in the in from the education space, from uh, like School Library Journal or uh, ISTE or all these things. We we really uh, we're really proud of those awards that we get, and we care about them. We also like wire cutter reviews. Um, <laughs> But so yes, that, there could be a label, but more importantly, I think there's an education of parents not kind of like taking over and being um, over, uh, over anxious uh, around their kids uh, and letting them fail and letting them iterate, letting them create, um, and then and letting the STEM stream, stream A happen. Jim, do you, do you want to talk on this a bit too about yeah, this is a great question, and um, you know, just for the record, we do already offer stream products, but we had the reading, not robotics, so we definitely need to define something here <laughs> as we keep going. Um, but yeah, what I would say is that this could be, it could be extremely valuable to have some uh, standards in place, but the first thing is we're never going to be able to police STEM and STEAM. As we mentioned, you walk down the halls here and it's everywhere. Okay, so STEM and STEAM is a marketing term, and there's going to be no way to control it. It's already out of control. But what we can do is if we get together and, you know, with retailers, with vendors, with teachers, districts, whatever, duke it out for what a good STEM, STEAM toy should, what should be the requirements, okay? It'll be hard, but I think something could be written like that. But the key is going to be, if this is going to have any value, there's going to need to be an agency in place that takes those requirements, and then vendors can submit their toys, and they get approval by this agency. And then that seal is what would go onto the box to say, yes, we've gotten approval for the XYZ you know, uh, Toy uh, Association for STEM, and our, our toy has been approved. That's the only way to police it because you're never going to be able to police STEM and STEAM and STREAM and STREAM A and anything on the box. It's going to happen. Um, just one, one quick thing, because I think I may have neglected to mention that the last 10 to 15 minutes um, of the hour, we are going to have time for questions from the audience. So if anything's coming up, please write down questions, and we'll, we'll have an opportunity for that. Um, so um, the next question I want to talk about is about um, social, emotional learning and social interaction um, with through play and learning. Um, this is something that developmentalists know that children learn a lot through n not even necessarily the toy itself, but through the way that that toy or that play sphere may promote um, communication and problem solving and cooperation and all of that. Um, and so I'm curious, um, Andres, I'd love to hear from you first, is um, 
is designing opportunities for social interaction within the, the toy itself, whether it's children together, children adult, is that a part of um, the design process for a STEAM toy, for a STEM toy? You know, I think we've started distinguishing STEM and STEAM primarily because we found a need to have more kids pursue this as a profession, to enter these fields, to pursue it as, a, uh, as an opportunity for a career. Um, <coughs> and, you know, working in this space, we realize you're working very much on products or services, things for other people, for consumers. And I think a key component of that is social, actually having that, uh, like a sense of empathy, an understanding for what that consumer is going to experience on the other end is, uh, is critical if you're going to be doing it successfully. And being able to understand how their eyes see things, how their hands will, will interact with the product, all of those delicate little details are really what determine how well you can actually execute a product outside of just the, the basic scientific principles that it's teaching. Um, Tom, I know you're, you have experience as a, as a teacher as well, and also with your you know, company in classroom settings. Um, and so I'm curious if the social interaction aspect of toys and STEM toys, educational toys, is something that is talked a lot about in the design process or in conceiving them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and I think that, um, you know, innovation in the 21st century is going to be driven by collaboration. I think the romanization of um, Edison alone in his workshop coming up with the next, you know, great invention is, is just that. It's a romanticized notion. Um, the idea of preparing our children for the real world, which I think ultimately is a big goal of all of us here at this table, um, involves teaching them, you know, emotional quotient and social emotional learning. And our roots in the education system in the schools um, is, is really where our DNA um, is at. And, and, and by that, I mean um, many of our products from the ground up were designed with the idea that multiple children would be engaged with them together at one time, uh, and the guides are even written and such. And if anything, sometimes when trying to get our products into the parent market, uh, we would have to try to find single player approaches because so many of them are designed for a collaborative input. Uh, and so teaching those skills early, teaching children that the real world involves working with others and uh, solving problems together, and then building that into the design, whether it's through guides that encourage multiplayer approaches to something, uh, challenges where one child can set up a challenge for another, or collaborate on the challenge together, I think is very important. And sometimes the, the trade-off is that you end up having to put a lot more into your product that might not be in the costing that you want, but it's the right thing to do because it's really important for children to be able to learn these skills early. So just a quick thing I want to jump on, um, the, um, particularly on social interaction. So um, this is a question I get all the time, and I'm sure many uh, panelists get it as well, is, uh, what, is uh, wh what do we think about screen time? Um, a lot of parents are very anxious about the amount of time their kids are spending on the screen, um, and they're uh, trying to get them off the screen and really kind of nervous about it. And every other day, there's a new study that says, uh, ban screen time before 18 months. Uh, you can allow it between 18 and 24 months as long as it's one hour and it's educational. If you're watching and you're with someone, it's okay. Actually, it's necessary because otherwise they won't understand how to use the screen. It's very, it's continuously contradicting uh, research um, that's happening. But I think what's important is to remember what we already know. So we may not know the impact of screen time. We may not know the damage or the benefit that a screen has and we're gonna find things out every day. What we do know and there's decades of research on this, is that social interaction is a key component of helping with development of kids. That is a fact. That is not uh, debated. That is, there, there's no need to create new research on it. We know that it's a key component of how kids develop um, as well-rounded human beings, as collaborators, as creators. And so I think then by inference you can say um, if face-to-face um, -face interaction is so important and the screen is in the way of that, then it is taking away from something that we know is working, so we need to have, make more room for what's working. Um, what we believe in is always, there's always kind of a blended answer. So um, last, mid last year, we acquired a company called DIY.org, which, which is an online platform for, uh, for learning for kids. Um, it's a screen-based uh, solution. It's about online learning and videos, but what you are learning is hands-on play. So it's using the screen in order to get you off the screen. And so the, the, it's, it's these things that I think are important. We're like, we are searching for answers for what is new, and we have to remember what we already know and bring it with us. And social interaction cannot be um, 
in debate anymore. It cannot be kind of um, on the chopping block. It is a, it's a thing that we owe to ourselves and to our kids to bring forward with us. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point that in, in some cases a screen though can be what facilitates the social interaction. Yeah. You have kids working on something in their home, but they're able to interact with other kids working on that same thing in their home at some, you know, at some other place, but they're interacting in that case through the screen. That is the social and the collaboration coming through that medium, which yeah, is really, exactly, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, so, and, the, and this kind of leads to our next question, which is, um, you know, as a, um, as, a, as a goal, I know, of, of uh, STEAM toys and, and this whole push to um, prepare more children uh, to eventually, hopefully, enter into STEAM careers and um, uh, pursue that. Part of that is, is uh, helping kids and also maybe their parents overcome kind of innate fears that are often um, kind of embodied about, uh, you know, these like, you know, science and technology and math and this idea, you know, certain kids growing up, I, I certainly have this as a parent, I'm not good at math, I don't have a math brain. Um, Netta, I'd love to hear your thoughts on if, how STEAM toys can be a way to, you know, help promote this, like, growth mindset, comfort um, with, these, with these subjects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, at Klutz, we have a line called Maker Lab, um, going off of the whole maker movement. Um, and the tagline for that is empower curious minds. And I just love that so much because kids are naturally curious. We know that. Um, and what does it mean to empower them? It means giving them the tools and materials that they need to feel successful and build that creative confidence um, and realize that they're actually good at this and they enjoy doing it and maybe it'll lead them to do something else. Um, so, you know, a kid might say, I'm not good at math, I'm not good at science, but they want to grow crystals and make a really cool crystal dinosaur, or they want to be able to engineer a gumball machine. Um, they'll want to, you know, fold paper airplanes and learn about drag and lift. Um, so once they realize they could do that and they're comfortable with that, it's going to really um, give them that confidence and, you know, parents, also, you know, I think they're the ones that know that STEM and STEAM is important, but they might not realize that it goes beyond coding, it goes beyond chemistry. There's so much more there. And so it's up to us as the toy makers, you know, to really introduce those subjects in ways that um, will help the kids feel comfortable. Um, Andres, can you talk about this, this question too, about helping how toys can be a way to help, um, you know, kids, parents, kind of overcome maybe an intimidation about STEAM subjects, STEM yeah, the, subjects. It was a term you mentioned earlier, uh, scaffolding, and it, it, you know, it's something I heard working with a lot of educators who, who focus on teaching these challenging subjects, kids who have difficulties with these, and basically trying to give kids those easy wins. Um, and it's a thing we, we struggle with our product, um, getting kids to that baseline where they're feeling challenged and they're feeling pushed, but you're not getting to the point of frustration and quitting. Um, and getting them to be able to build upon that and work creatively. Um, also, watching kids when they are working creatively and working on their own, you see them actually going only at a pace that they're ready for. Mm. And you see them sort of getting to those stopping points and, and, and finding, find their way, finding their way through it naturally. And um, you know, that's something we've noticed. Um, <clears throat> so this, this question's for Aya first, because um, I know this is something you've spoken about a lot in this uh, uh, really critical of what you've dealt with a little bit, um, which is that, uh, so inclusion and diversity are really important. We know this is really important in uh, getting more, you know, more, uh, you know, Americans, more people into STEM fields, um, because we know that women are underrepresented still. Uh, we know that, you know, people, um, you know, from uh, uh, different cultural, socioeconomic backgrounds can be underrepresented in STEM careers. Um, how can toys, uh, how can toys help to um, increase diversity uh, within STEM? I mean, is that a, is that a push of, of, of something, you know, toys should be pushing themselves, companies should be pushing themselves to do, and if so, what might that look like? Um, I think not only it's something that uh, toy companies should pay attention to, I think it is, it's um, borderline irresponsible not to. Um, I think that there is a, uh, there's a major problem uh, with um, diversity in STEM at the adult stage. 
um, there are fewer, there are f um, lower um, numbers, numbers of women in STEM fields are actually declining. Um, uh, minorities are very underrepresented. Uh, technology uh, field in particular has become, uh, technology companies are defining how we interact with the world, how we interact with uh, data, how we interact with each other, how we interact with countries, how we interact with the environment. And so the role that technology plays is huge. And when uh, in those roles, uh, uh, the real population is not represented, uh, then a small group of people is making decision for the rest of the population that I think is actually very dangerous. So we need to get more women, we need to get more minorities, we need to get more languages um, in, in leading positions in STEM, and that's, I think, uh, and, um, uh, you know, a, um, a call to anybody that would um, that is able to affect it. Uh, we um, have always considered this extremely important. I started the company in 2011, um, and uh, I used to call it a hidden mission. It was a hidden mission to get more girls into uh, STEM and tech. It was hidden because I didn't want us to be pigeonholed as a girls' engineering product, and that was important because we needed to gain credibility um, as a STEM toy and tool uh, for all kids um, and uh, and also overcorrect for the diversity problem. So we, um, we uh, everything we develop is gender neutral. Um, it's intentionally gender neutral because it's about inviting girls and boys into the play. Um, it means that uh, it's the way the product, um, it's the kinds of inventions we showcase, it's uh, the kinds of marketing campaigns we launch, it's the kinds of inventors we show. It's not about uh, robots and cars and, um, and shooting games, it's about Ferris wheels and bubble blowers and prank machines. Um, it's about the, the way the product looks, it's about how we label things. It's a very, very intentional design principle that is um, uh, really um, embraced by anybody in the company. Um, as a result, we have 40% of our user base is girls, which is about four times the average in electronics and construction. Um, so it's something that we're very, very proud of, And but we uh, don't rest on our laurels. We work on it all the time. Um, I think that um, there's uh, a lot of, uh, that's kind of when it comes to gender, but then you have to also expand uh, into different forms of diversity, um, uh, different uh, learning uh, speeds, learning abilities, uh, being able to accommodate for kids that are, uh, that are autistic or on the spectrum, uh, kids that maybe uh, are introverted, are not as comfortable um, kind of speaking out. All of these things are factors that we have to take into account because we, wanna re we want the future to represent uh, the population that we have. And so this is something that we lean on our community uh, to do, and we're constantly hearing feedback about. Um, we have stories about how kids that have um, learning disabilities, whether it's dyslexia or autism or multiple sclerosis, use little bits to, um, uh, to, to really kind of flourish in their learning, and it's something that we uh, want to continuously improve on and, and continue to focus on. And I would invite anybody who's in product development to uh, to really put a focus on it as well, because it's the the impact when you succeed is really um, just incredible to watch. Yeah, I just want to see if anyone else wants to jump in on this question too. It's such a it's such a big one about you know the potential for the toy companies can play in this. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a great answer, Aya. By the way. Um, and uh, you know, at Learning Resources, I think one of the, uh, because again, of our roots in education, um, our customer base, we're, we're frequently hear from them because we do have uh, an entire line of special needs products. And I think the commitment has to be there uh, at a corporate level and, and at a company level, and that's what our company is at, um, to make products that may not make a lot of money. And, and I think that's very important. We need to, to make sure that we are approaching it not just from a bottom line, but um, servicing everyone out there. So we'll frequently get um, you know emails from parents, um, and I'll tell you something, it, it can really make a difference and, and make you recognize that what you're doing is important. When the parent of a special needs child says that a product that you helped to develop like really touched that child, um, you know, you can't you can't put a value on that, and I, but you do have to make a commitment to it because, like I said, it's not always going to be the, the most popular product, and it's not going to be something that you're going to um, you know, get your big bonus off of. And so I think it's important for companies to make a commitment to servicing those with special needs um, and, and all of those that might otherwise not have an opportunity because if we don't make those toys, who will? Thank you. Yeah. I'll add to that, too. I totally agree, and uh, you know, some of the things we do um, is also, you know, um, it may not be the biggest payback, like you said, but to do the marketing to those minority, um, you know, in our product, 
yeah, we clearly have the construction sets that build the robots and the spaceship and so forth. But then we also market how you can build the unicorn and how you can build the flower and the cat and that. And we have, you know, a video on our YouTube site about a girl's having a party and, you know, girl power. And, you know, it's really advertising that these toys, you know, can be, can be uh, gender neutral, okay, and can be used for both. Um, yeah, it's, you know, the, it's the foundation because we know sort of that, you know, when you get to the point of, of actually the job applications and saying, well, we just don't get as many applications from, you know, minority groups or from women or whatever, how far back it can actually start to start helping those children move into those fields. Um, you know, toy companies can clearly play a role there. Um, so uh, a couple more questions before we then move to the audience. Um, this one, um, Tom, I'd love to hear from you on this, which is, um, do STEM or STEAM toys need to have a curriculum or a guide accompanying them? Uh, short answer, no. Okay, so I want to be able to give a one succinct answer. Um, longer answer, I really do think it depends on the product. And to use an example, I think that people can design uh, products that by their very nature um, have an inherent, like, uh, discoverability and open exploration to them that might not necessitate a guide. But um, when we do something, as an example, like a design and engineering play set, uh, which is rooted in the design and engineering process, which is a little bit of uh, what Aya touched on in her first answer, and that starts with teaching parents and children. The design and engineering process um, starts with asking a question and then you know, forming a hypothesis and going all the way through to creating it, testing it, and then improving upon it. Um, we know that in including that information for the parent, it fits that percentage of parents who say, I'm not equipped otherwise to know this. So just giving me these building pieces, but not at least giving me um, some structure behind it doesn't help me at all to then convey that information to, to our child. So I really do think that the answer is no, not all STEM toys by design need a guide, and it is possible to design one that is so open-ended open, open uh, ended and exploratory it doesn't. Um, but in many cases, it helps both the parent and the teacher to have some fundamental instruction that can then go and allow them to give the basis to the child, and then the child takes it and runs from there with it. So give them the basic idea, give them the basic concept, and let them go from there. Netta, can you talk about this as well? Sure. Your instructions. Yeah, um, I'd agree that no, you don't always have to have a guide. I think if something's like, you know, blocks or Legos, something like that, you know, you don't need a guide necessarily. However, if you've ever played with blocks, you know, some kids know inherently what to do with them um, and do some really amazing, interesting things. And some kids, and me, uh, I just make towers and <laughs> I don't really know what to do after that. Um, so having some sort of guidebook, having some thought starters, some prompts from educators, from, you know, it really allows you to open up your imagination and create something really interesting. Um, you know, Klutz is part of Scholastic, it's Scholastic Books Rule, um, so we love our books. And I love them because they give us the opportunity to have photographs of real world examples, step-by-step um, -step illustrations, you know, um, and the text. And when you're seeing it in those different ways, it sinks in more deeply. Um, and, you know, kids learn in different ways. Some really need the written instructions and some love those step-by-step -step illustrations. Um, and all of it just helps it sink in in, in a, a different way for kids. Yeah, I think this kind of takes us back to our, one of our first points, which was about open-ended versus, you know, more guided. and. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So I, I think we are now going to take some questions from all of you, I hope. Um, so if people have a question, please uh, raise your hand or stand up. And um, there's, uh, there's people coming around with microphones. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, my, my frustration is, is I took my toy store and I created a hands-on play area in it that's um, based on history because I found that although parents have a lot of lofty ideas, they don't have the backgrounds to be able to get down or even they're a little bit intimidated maybe to get down on their hands and knees and play with the kids. So a lot of times it's hard to sell the toy if the parent themselves is intimidated by them and that's the thing I see with the stem and the steam because this is a new thing and 
you know, and there's that segment of grandparents that buy a lot of toys. I would say now it almost seems as grandparents buy more toys than parents. But um, so I, I wonder how it would be to be able to make it um, reach, maybe teachable to parents and reachable to children and somehow, like within, because the instructions, parents look at them like they just went to Ikea. They don't want to, they're like, they're like, okay, I'm going to give this to my kid and they're going to figure it out. And it, it seems like they're in that space, there's, there's just something missing. Maybe it's just not you know, and I, I do everything I can to build out play spaces that gently walk them through things as much as I can, and it has totally helped them then know what the toy does, how it, how they can play with it, and then they can go into the shop and purchase it. But it's if they just take the box or a grandparent buys the box and sends it, it, it doesn't get the use that it could get, so I was just wondering about that possibility of maybe making some kind of connection. So it sounds like this is kind of a question about demystifying to an extent or maybe um, helping with the intimidation factor um, for the people buying the toys and wanting to play with the toys with the kids if someone wants to. Um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, attempt an answer. So um, I would say, you know, the analogy I gave in the beginning when we started is about the healthy food movement. Um, it took some time to educate consumers on why that was important. Um, uh, we all uh, were used to buying mass consumer pro mass food products uh, that were unhealthy, and it took some time to uh, for us to learn what are the ingredients that should or shouldn't be in food, how to evaluate something whether it's nutritious or calorific for no reason. And um, it, the answer is, it takes we have to do the work, all of us. Um, I think uh, your hands-on play spaces are really important. Uh, the parent may not convert at that one point exactly when they're playing, but you're affecting the way they think um, about um, about the toy and about the space that they have to be in. Um, I'll sound like a broken record when I say I think it's getting everybody comfort comfortable with failure. Um, I think that is the biggest um, impact that we can have is getting parents to be like, it's okay if you don't know how to use the toy. If you're using it and you hit a stumbling block, go on YouTube, search for answers, look at the instruction guide, try to come up with it, show your kid that you're okay with failing and you're not frustrated and gonna throw it in the garbage and gonna call customer service and say your toy is broken. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, that's kind of more, um, more helpful. I think it's also showing kids that um, they can uh, stumble and then they can go look for an answer uh, that's not given to them right then and there. Um, so I think I think that we, you know, we just do the work. We talk about the importance of, you know, what we call playful failure. Um, some of the things that you're doing, I think science museums do very well. So I would, um, I think science museums are in incredible and they're beautiful spaces and, um, they need help thinking about how to get kids in there and more collaborations. And so I think there's a lot of room to do stuff uh, with science museums as well. Um, and and if, if we're kind of collectively as a group less focused on what is the right thing to do and more focused on let's, let's get everybody comfortable with this experimental state that we're in, I think that we might have a lot better outcome. Or we will, I believe. Great. Does anyone else want to? Yeah. Yeah, and just to add that to try to help it make it easier for when you do that search on YouTube. I mean, we do try to uh, put videos on our website for the you know each of the products that we sell. You know, if you, again the instructions were too intimidating, you can see a video of how you build the thing that's uh, in the set. So there are things we can do like that to, again, try to reduce the intimidation, make it easier on parents and children. I, I know for one of our sets in particular, it was used in the school and with the instructions, they were having trouble, but they went and saw the video and oh, it worked and it was great and now they got it. Okay, so that may be one way. I also think that the, the onus is on us to make sure that the, the products that we design are age appropriate, you know. Uh, sometimes I think we can all be guilty of designing something that we're pretty sure uh, children at a certain age are capable of handling. Let's make sure that those children can, in fact, handle the product at that age. And if they can't, make the necessary adjustments before putting it into the marketplace. And then make sure that the instructions that are included um, to your question 
are written in such a manner that the, the common parent who might not have a background in STEM or STEAM can follow it and not be intimidated by it. I mean, th I don't think you can, uh, uh, you can uh, emphasize enough how important a well-written guide can be. Anyone who's put something together, whether it's a toy or a consumer product, can attest. I, I sometimes am in glory. Look at who made this guy. This, this is a piece of art. This is, I was able to do this by myself. There is, there is a, it's, a, it's a great thing when you can put something out there that is easy to follow. And we should, we should hold ourselves to those standards. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And the role for video, it sounds like, is something that's probably potentially really fruitful there, like showing, sort of just, set, you know, multiple ways to show how to, how to do something. A structured booklet doesn't literally only have to be a booklet. It could be a YouTube video. Um, does, um, do we have any other questions? I have, hello, are you on? Oh, hi. Um, as a professor of early childhood education and somebody who prepares people to spend their lives with young children, I want to add some letters for this STEAM, STEM, STREAM, and I want you to see if you can help me with this, thinking about this. S-T-R. What's your R? Reading. E-A-M. Let's add another M to that. Music. How involved is music in terms of technology, mathematical thinking, et cetera, et cetera? Then I'm going to add two S's for social studies so that my students, my college students, when they graduate and they're finished, are you ready? In terms of their preparation in working with young children, it is science, technology, reading, engineering, art, mathematics, getting it, music, music. <laughs> social studies, and of course, how are they doing that? And I love what your comments were through direct involvement. And I heard you say physical, tactile, kinesthetic learning. That's what early childhood education is. So congratulations and, and applause for all the things that you're doing that helped to promote STEAM and STEM and STREAM and STREAM. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What is your involvement with the U.S. Department of Education? Are you guys involved with them and then also with the educators? You guys have a great opportunity. I see a lot of people here that have retail uh, businesses and uh, from a K through 12 standpoint, you can start the kids off in the school and then it can lead out of the school back into the home. Um, go ahead. Um, we, um, Little Bits has been working with the New York City Department of Education for many years. We have some uh, initiatives with the uh, U.S. Department of Education, but our bigger relationship is with, with the New York City Department of Education, and now it's become a template that we're starting to talk to other states about um, expanding. So New York City Department of Education for the past many years, I think this is the fourth year, they've been doing something called the Summer of STEM, um, and we've been a toolkit uh, that helps there. It's about 2,100 students, about um, about uh, 300 teachers, I believe. Um, and it's a summer program uh, where uh, we're training, we're helping train the teachers to uh, use little bits in the classroom in informal, in formal and informal uh, learning. Um, there's, uh, it's been, uh, we've been doing it for four years because it's been doing so well. And so now we're ready to take it um, to uh, other departments of education and states as well. Um, I'd say the thing that you mentioned is a real thing that the um, tension between retail and education is um, extra visible, I believe, for companies like us because um, you have to play within the rules of the retail world, which are always driving price to the bottom, the message to its simplest form, uh, put everything that you want to say on a box that somebody can look at within 10 seconds and understand. And that's really kind of pulling you from a different direction than uh, creating a rigorous and, and powerful educational tool is. Um, so we a uh, little bit have decided to uh, start spending more time on education because we see that it's a higher, it's a bigger, bigger leverage point for us. Uh, but we need some of these states and departments of education to lean in and um, and you know want to explore these opportunities because they're the ones with the uh, the access. So um, if anybody is in the room there, I would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, yeah, our our, uh, our current experience is uh, is much more direct to teacher uh, and direct to schools at the local school district. Uh, 
I, we're very proud of the fact that our, our company is probably one of the few that attends the major toy fairs around the world as, ma as well as the major education um, uh, uh, conferences as well and uh, I would say that the the opportunity that we continue to to thrive on is because of our grounding and our face-to-face -face connection with uh, the teachers at the individual level and at the school district level, uh, it allows us to really be ahead of the curve of what is going to come to the parent market. Um, and that's where, uh, um, to be honest, and we, we pat ourselves on the back a little bit about this, but we had STEM products out there, uh, we actually say a little too soon, because we were, we were working with the teachers and we were making you know, great STEM products and putting them in the schools, and so we thought, oh, so this will be right out there, and we put a whole line out at retail that didn't do as well, because we realized we, uh, we weren't quite there yet, but that is really important for us because um, having that face-to-face -face time with the teachers allows us to know, first of all, that it's, um, to your point, uh, sir, and thank you very much for those comments, uh, that we're getting all of the, the, the streams as they're occurring, you know, at the early age, and then making sure that that can translate into the home market, um, you know, in an, in an acceptable format. And I'll just... Add to that, we also work directly with the schools, also you know, with distributors that can build curriculum around bundles of our stuff and then actually train schools, okay, so that uh, the schools on how to leverage um, our products for teaching STEM and STEAM and technology. Um, also, you know, going to the, as mentioned, the educational conferences, we were just at ECRM, where I'll have to put in my blurb now. Uh, we won first place Buyer's Choice Award at the educational session. Okay, so very much appreciating uh, the educational as <clears throat> aspects of eBlocks. Um, so doing more of that absolutely is being able to to reach out to the educational space. And you know, one thing I want to point out is there's a report, you know, from the U.S. government about trying to create these um, STEM communities to do more of this. Okay, to get more kids into STEM, and it's a 50-page report, and the one word that was never mentioned in there was toy, and so I really think that we have a lot of work to do, okay? Our, our, I'll even include ourselves. I mean, we got to get it out there. Toys are one of the best educational tools out there, and there's nothing wrong with having toys in schools, okay? That really is work we need to get done. That is a, an excellent thought to um, end our conversation on. Um, and I want to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience for being part of this conversation. Thank you to the Toy Association who have invested a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of research into uh, you know, this whole conversation of, of STEM toys, of STEAM toys, learning toys. And I hope it's the beginning of you know, what will continue. Um, if people have more questions, I think that our, you know, many of our panelists can would be happy to answer them one-on-one. -on -one. I would obviously be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, so thank you so much uh, to everybody. Thank you.